Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. Today's program is an hour and a half long and is the second in a series of six programs AI Ohio is producing this year focused on advocacy with the theme, Advocacy Begins With You. The AIA Advocacy Committee has prepared this program as a follow-up to our virtual day at the State House, where our members had the opportunity to meet with legislators from across the state. Today's seminar is titled Government 101 and is focused on sharing the process of transforming an idea into legislation in Ohio. As part of our session today, we will also be featuring Bob Leversage, FAIA, on where the legislative process actually takes place and highlights of the history of Ohio State House. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Our goal for the series is to provide you with the tools you need to become an advocate for AI Ohio, for your chapters, and for your community. Before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank our featured bronze sponsors. Pull the slide up, Kate. Uh, Bylaski Cleveland and Centria for supporting today's event. AI Ohio would also like to thank and recognize all of our annual sponsors who are an integral part of bringing quality programming to our members this year. Without their help and support, AI Ohio would not be able to present the innovative program we've developed this year. Before we get started, please turn on your video, put yourself on mute and get ready to put your questions in the chat box. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions either during the program or as part of the Q&A. One last item, Kate will be putting a link in the chat towards the end of the presentation. You will follow the link to enter your information and member number so that you receive your CEUs for today's programs. So next up is Kate. Thanks, Karen. Hello, everyone. I'm Kate Brunswick, uh, the Executive Vice President of AI Ohio, and I'm gonna get us started with our content today. Um, the whole process of how laws are made in Ohio begins with an idea. Examples of ideas that AI Ohio has proactively sought to advance through legislation in the past include the Good Samaritan Law, which was passed in 2014, um, current, the payment assurance legislation, which is currently being held in the Senate, um, and the Statute of Repose. For today's program, we will be following a bill through the legislature. And in many parts of the presentation, we will be referencing Senate Bill 49, which is the bill number for the payment assurance legislation. We kind of, what we often refer to it as PAL, um, that AI Ohio is currently working through this process. The idea was brought to AIA Ohio three years ago by Chris Toddy, AIA. Um, he's a member from Cleveland. The PAL was first introduced as a bill during the last General Assembly, but failed to get out of committee, which is a process we're going to discuss here in a minute. Uh, it's been reintroduced this year. We have high hopes that it will advance through both chambers and eventually become law. The first thing that anyone needs to do before an idea becomes potential legislation is to gather data. Uh, sources for data that AI Ohio has used in the past include surveying AI Ohio members and firm owners, as well as reaching out to other AI components, uh, AI National, the state local government network, um, and AI knowledge communities. We've also used data sources made available from other organizations in the construction industry and I'll remark that um, Beth Easterday from ACEC Ohio is on the meeting today. So welcome Beth and thank you for joining us. Uh, gathering data includes researching similar laws in other states and also reviewing laws already on the books in Ohio, making sure there aren't conflicts. Um, as a component of the AIA, we also need to make sure any legislation we hope to pursue is in compliance with AI national policies and positions. And then when gathering data, we need to determine who the bill might draw as allies and who might oppose the bill. And as we begin to build the case to develop legislation, we also try to identify a legislator or two who might sponsor the bill. And if we can get several legislators and bipartisan support, 
the case for the bill is going to be greatly strengthened. Turning an idea into a piece of legislation is tricky. Um, of course, it helps if your lobbyist is an attorney familiar with construction law and capable of drafting legislation at AI Ohio, our lobbyist, Luther Liggett, is one such person. Um, most people or organizations, however, do not draft their own legislation. Instead, it's drafted by the LSC, uh, the Legislative Services Commission. So the LSC is a nonpartisan agency that provides the Ohio General Assembly with drafting, um, research, budget and fiscal analysis for legislation that might be considered by either chamber of the assembly. Once the bill is drafted, the sponsoring legislator files the bill with the clerk and the bill receives a number. This can take time and this part of the process illustrates the importance of the bill sponsor. A new legislator or a bill with only a sponsor from the minority party may not become a priority. And like many bills introduced each year, bills that have little or no support of the majority party or are not sponsored by an experienced legislator may live only to die a slow, obscure death. Luther, you're on today, and I'm sure you can talk a little bit about the importance of knowing who supports and who opposes a bill. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for everybody uh, 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 being here today. Uh, a lot of uh, folks will tell you that making law is like sausage, and I have to tell you, I disagree. Um, I truly believe that when you're taught in high school how a bill becomes law in our government is absolutely true. The problem that people miss is like any expertise. I can't do what you guys do, you spent your careers doing. Uh, and likewise, it, it takes some specialty and effort. Uh, and, and the truth is it works exactly as it was intended by our founders 200 years ago, but it takes patience. How many times the board at AIA has heard me say, it's drip, drip, drip. There is no cutting a corner. You, you can't uh, slip it in between numbers and Deuteronomy and the budget bill and think it's gonna survive. That isn't the way the process truly works successfully. It's about consensus building. And the word consensus is a very important term. It does not mean compromise. It means getting everybody who has an interested viewpoint in the room to have their say. And I, I as an example, I remember uh, representing a, a, a client who was a construction contractor <clears throat> and he sued the University of Cincinnati for a change order of only $21,000. Uh, he, he, he hired a lawyer who had no idea about government. And the reality is a courtroom case about the University of Cincinnati is about government. And they don't think that way. So he fires his lawyer, hires me. And with one phone call to the attorney general, I got $15,000. And I said, Jimmy, there you go, case settled. And he says, but, I want to tell my story. I said, well, okay, send me $5,000 upfront retainer and we'll go to trial and we'll get 21,000. And of course he said, I'm not gonna do that. That's a waste of money. I said, that's right. But, but so he took the 15 and didn't pay my fee. But I think the important point is people like to tell their story. That's what consensus building is about. It's not about winning or losing or a, dividing a pie. And, and going back to the example of the judiciary, when I take a problem, I think of a tic-tac-toe grid. There are three branches of government. There's the court, there's the legislature, and there are the executive agencies. And there's the federal and state and local level. And sometimes the problem can be solved with a phone call, like my example. Sometimes it requires a change in the law, but, and sometimes it's an executive agency or a judicial decision that is required. Uh, I personally uh, uh, wrote or helped draft the statute of repose that was passed as part of the tort reform bill. It was my innovation. I came up with the idea. The Supreme Court was always overturning the legislature because they said 
Well, we have to look at the intent of the legislature. And since Ohio doesn't recognize any uh, legislative intent document, we'll make it up. Well, that's BS. So I said, you know, the, the Ohio revised code means codify into an index system. And it did not happen until the 1950s. Prior to that, the, it was the general code, which was just a big pile of, of statutes. And, and it was non-codified language. Today, we have the same thing. We have the revised code, which is indexed, which everybody thinks is the law, but it's not. It's also the non-codified law. And so at the end of every bill, you get the legislature can write what they intended. And for the statute of repose, we wrote in non-codified law that it was intended to protect architects and engineers. And that does not appear in the revised code. But when we went to court to defend the statute of repose and the Supreme Court said, what did the uh, legislature intend? We pulled that right out of the non-codified and said to the court, here you go. It's intended to protect the architects and engineers. And the Supreme Court upheld the statute of repose for design profession. Now that may seem complicated, but it isn't to me, that's what I do. What it requires is patience and expertise and consensus building. Taking PAL, Senate Bill 49 as an example, before we even talked to the first Senator or state representative, we identified every interested party at the federal, state, local level, in the legislature, in the administrative agencies, and in the private sector. We looked up all of the case law that related to the issue. We found that five years ago, the legislature had passed a very similar concept for real estate brokers. They, as, as design professionals, you may not file a mechanics lien, which is in the Ohio constitution. The Ohio constitution uh, actually codifies a tradesman's mechanics lien, but the, the the, the twist is it has to improve the dirt. And a litmus test for whether it does or not, does the property tax go up? Is it an improvement? <clears throat> and if the property tax goes up and it's a real estate improvement, you don't charge sales tax on it either. If there is no improvement to the real estate, you charge sales tax to the owner for that work uh, and you do not have a mechanics lien. I know that's a little complicated, but that's the point of understanding all the four corners of the issue first. We went to every uh, uh, agency or every uh, trade association with a draft of the bill, including the Ohio Bankers League. And it may not be obvious, but they, have, they represent all the banks that have mortgages. And what do they want about uh, another lien being on a real estate? They don't want it to be in front of the mortgage. So we put right in the bill. It's not in front of the mortgage. That was easy. <laughs> and you've never seen the bankers come up and oppose it. We went to the Ohio Bar Association who have lobbyists. And they're on both sides of all issues because uh, there was a, uh, there's a kind of a common saying about lawyers. A little town that's too small to even support one lawyer always seems to be able to support two. That's because they argue. So lawyers, they always have two sides. And, and so they were not an issue. Uh, then we went and enlisted the help of ACEC with Beth Easterday's team uh, because the engineers. Uh, we uh, also talked to the surveyors, uh, uh, at the Professional Sur Surveyors Association, who also support the bill, as do the landscape architects. We also went to the licensure boards and say, what do you think about this? And which of course that's not really their issue, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And that's the neat thing about consensus building. Nobody likes surprises. That's the rule. Nobody likes surprises. No surprise birthdays, none of that crap. Uh, <laughs> tell them up front, be transparent. And you know, when they come with a, a reasonable request, can you change this sentence here? Or we've got a problem there. You say, yes. My rule in public policy, I've been doing I started in um, the George Washington University undergrad in law 
I started working on Capitol Hill for Senator John Glenn uh, during the Watergate trials. And then I worked for the Attorney General for eight years at the administration. And we get calls all the day, people want you to do something. So I have a real simple rule. <clears throat> Always say yes, unless it's against your principles or you've already committed. If you've taken a position, you just say that. Or if they want you to do something wrong, you say no. But other than that, if you're a public servant, say yes. And I think that's the same way with legislation. It's hard work. Uh, if you're patient and you involve everybody, no surprises, and you just say yes, that's what we did with Senate Bill 49. We then took the bill to Senator Hottinger, uh, Senator Hottinger, uh, Jay Hottinger, Jay is his first name. His parents operate Jay Electric, named after him, uh, and they are electrical contractors. So Jay, most people don't know that Jay knows the construction industry. And so he is now the number two guy, the president pro tempore of the Ohio Senate uh, and a Republican in the majority. So we wanted somebody in the majority, uh, but we'd also like uh, bipartisan support. So who did we pick? <laughs> Vernon Sykes from Akron has been, is one of the oldest, longest serving uh, Democratic senators in the legislature from Akron. And we asked him to jointly sponsor it, which is different than co-sponsoring. And the both of the senators agreed to jointly sponsor the bill. Uh, it was introduced with, and they circulate a co-sponsorship. Uh, and we got, you know, we were able to say that even before they wrote the bill, it was, we were not aware of any opposition. And that's the reward you get for being patient and diligent and consensus building. Talk to everybody uh, and, and say yes, unless it's against your principles or you've already made a commitment. The bill had three hearings last year and uh, was uh, had no opposition, did not make it out of the Senate in time. And so we've now had two hearings already and uh, have a commitment, uh, we think, that it'll get the third hearing and a vote to the Senate floor, which is where we're waiting. Uh, and then we can talk about later. Kate can go on and tell you the rest of the story of how a bill becomes law. Yes, yeah. Don't get ahead of us, Luther. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. Thanks, Luther. Uh, so the bill format for all legislation is the same. It's created in a way that is easy to follow and reference. Bills are written in a standard format used by the LSC to allow legislators to be able to review the, the, the bill language and reference proposed changes. The bill identifies the sponsors and the sections of the Ohio Revised Code that will, would be affected if enacted. And of course, a bill can't move forward without work from the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate. Um, as Luther mentioned, our Powell legislation this year is starting in the Senate. Um, and Karen has some interesting facts about that. So Karen. Thanks, Kate. This is one of the points during the program where we'll be providing some helpful facts for you who may, may not be as familiar with Ohio government. Most know that the Ohio Senate is made up of 33 members, but there are other interesting facts about the Ohio Senate that you may not be aware of. So the current Ohio Senate is made up of eight members who are Democrats and 25 members who are Republicans. The first session to include a female legislator was in 1923 and currently eight of the 33 members of the Senate are women. Each member can serve a maximum of two four-year terms in the Senate for a total of eight years. Approximately one half of the 33 seats in the Ohio Senate are up for election every two years. When a Senator has reached a term limit in the Senate, they can run for a seat in the Ohio mm -hmm. House. The Senators who are part-time legislators earn a salary of 65,000 $528 per year. To override a gubernatorial veto, the Senate needs a three-fifths vote or 20 senators, which is called a supermajority. Let's get back to the process. Bruce uh, Sikanik's with us and is gonna pick up where Kate left off. Bruce? Thank you, Karen. Uh, good afternoon. Today, I'm going to help uh, to continue guide us through the next part of the bill's journey. Once assigned a bill number, 
uh, the bill is assigned to a committee of the chamber. The committee assignment is out of your control, but it is very important. The committee chair can decide to give the bill hearing the bill hearings or not. While many bills enter a committee, many never finish the process. I know that Karen has some interesting information about legislative committees. Karen? Thanks, Bruce. Just like AIA components, each body of the Ohio legislature uses committee to get the work done. Uh, the slide that we're seeing covers the many potential committees to which a bill could be assigned. Well, there are similar committees in the Senate and the House, each chamber sets their committees at the start of each legislative session. Well, some seasoned participants within the political process might be able to guess which committee a bill will be assigned. You really never know until the actual assignment takes place. Who would have guessed that our payment assurance legislation would have ended up in the Senate Judiciary Committee? Bruce, do you wanna pick, pick back up from there? Sure, thanks, Karen. It's important to have name recognition when uh, members of the committee where your bill is assigned. Some legislators may know who you are and why you're advancing a bill. Others will know little about the organization or the profession, and they will want to know why you want to have the legislation passed. This is where an event like the AIA Ohio Advocacy Day is incredibly helpful to an organization like AIA. We use this event to meet legislators at a time and in a venue where we're not necessarily asking for anything specific. Your late afternoon chat at a reception with a legislator might allow you at some point in the future to present your concerns and thoughts about legislation being heard. As with anything else, advocacy is about building relationships. Trust me, they remember you. So Luther, we talked a little bit about legislators. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the, the role of the PAC works with advocacy? Thank you, Bruce. Uh, again, I think that the understanding of a political action committee is greatly misunderstood. It doesn't help, for instance, that we have in Ohio indictments of the former Speaker of the House for funneling $60 million worth of ratepayer uh, cash to get a subsidy for the nuclear uh, legislation, House Bill 6 last session. And, and that gives everybody a bad name and a, a bad reputation. Um, and, and that is not the intent of political action committee or fundraising. What is the proper intent? Well, I wanna start with your business in your own world. It's always about networking, isn't it? Which is easier to go get a brand new client who you've never met, but you think would you be the greatest architect or engineer for, or getting new work from an old client who loves your product? The obvious answer is the latter. It's the person you have the relationship with. The same way in the practice of law. I don't work for anybody with whom I don't have a relationship. I'm an independent contractor. I don't want to be an employee. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to work with anonymous people, uh, but rather I want to be on their table of organization mentally. I don't want to be an afterthought where they hire a lawyer to sue somebody and I don't even know their business. I love visiting clients in their facilities to see how you make a widget. The same thing is with the legislatures. If you want to be part of the consensus building process, you need to know them and their ideas. What are all of the bills that they're sponsoring? What job do they have? Ohio is a part-time legislature, always has been. What's their other job? Are they a barber? Are they a coal miner? Are they a hairdresser? It's, it's, not, it's a common mistake that most Ohio legislators are not have no background in law. Uh, sometimes I wish that at least read the Constitution, but that's asking too much sometimes. <laughs> but back to the networking, the PAC is a secondary or tertiary aspect of the network. How are you meeting your legislators? And just like working a bill, it's drip, drip, drip. Bruce mentioned, he said, you don't necessarily need to have an agenda when you say, I'd like to introduce myself. And you might be surprised how that le local legislator is part of your life in other ways. 
can, uh, can you connect them up with the local county commissioner when you're trying to do a project with the courthouse and they don't have all the funding they need and they need some state funding. Uh, I will tell you, I have a good friend I just got off the phone with who has preserved the children's home in Xenia by working with all of the legislators in understanding the history after the Civil War of the orphans left by that great disaster in American history. And, and so understanding who they are, what the history is of the locality uh, and, and how the, and getting to know them and working together in helping government is the real key. The political action committee, I think is really important simply to say thank you. How else can you say thank you to a legislator? Number one, you can invite them to your local board meetings or your local chapter meetings. Uh, take a picture, put it in the newsletter and send the newsletter copy to the legislature, legislator. Number two, they love awards. If you think they've done something, you know, go down to the local uh, place where you buy all the baseball, kids' baseball trophies and have them cut a legislator of the year award and present it to them. And that's the context of political action. On the spend side, you will never have enough money to bribe somebody, and you shouldn't do that anyway, as we're seeing. But that's not the role. It's a thank you. It doesn't matter how much. It's to say, I appreciate your service. I know you have to campaign, and I want to be part of the team. On the fundraising side, everybody hates fundraising. I personally don't. I think it's always been part of my political world. And I, th I use this same message and I say, look, guys, you want a statute of repose? Does it help you? Would you not like to get sued for the rest of your life after you retire? Would you like uh, payment assurance legislation? And would you like to convince people, you know, be part of the process that we need some money. And it doesn't matter how little they're willing to give. It should be a cooperative effort. I'm very pleased and maybe Someone else wants to say this, but the AIA board is, the state board's 100% in, and we want everybody to be in. Uh, it's not about the dollar, uh, how large we can get it. It's the consensus participation that everybody's involved. And then you uh, make it only one little part of a broader network strategy. We had a state house day. We invited legislators to come in and talk by Zoom. That was a huge success. Uh, the pandemic is a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. So I would tell you that political action in my experience, I've done fundraising since 1982 and uh, uh, I enjoy it because it's an opportunity to get your message out and to be part of the process and to, and to say thank you to legislators without regard of the number. It's not about cash under the table, it's about your message on top of the table. And I would encourage you to participate. Does anyone, Bruce or Kate or Karen, we've talked about this elsewhere. Do you want to add to that point before we move on? And any questions too? Yeah, uh, you know, basically I think we've talked with a lot of chapters and we'll continue to talk to uh, chapters ongoing, but I think it's just important that uh, as we go forward with the pack, we have to realize that this is an annual uh, opportunity for us to uh, refresh our connections with legislators. And uh, like you said, Luther, it's about networking and, and that's really what's important. And if we don't continue that year after year, we lose that network connection, so. Great. We're gonna drop the, the PAC donation link in the chat here in a minute, so feel free. <laughs> well, Luther, we always, we always appreciate your insight. Uh, you bring a lot to the table uh, that, uh, that I think really helps us understand the process. So I'm going to continue on, but uh, we talk a little bit about the, uh, the legislative process here. In Ohio, um, the committee process includes a series of three hearings. The first is always the sponsor hearing. Uh, this is where the legislator or legislators who sponsored the bill testifies um, uh, to the committee where the bill has been assigned. Uh, in the case of SB 49, uh, Senators Vernon Sykes and Jay Hottinger testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee on February 23rd. The second hearing is uh, the proponent hearing. Uh, this is where the proponent, in this case, AIA Ohio, 
testifies to the committee in favor of the proposed legislation. For SB 49, Ohio's testimony was offered by Karen Planet, AIA, as AIA Ohio president, and myself as a firm owner. Uh, here's a sample of the testimony that we actually submitted to the committee. Some members who have testified for a bill on AIA Ohio's behalf admit to being intimidated by the process at first, but there are a few very simple rules to follow. First, the testimony must be delivered to the chair of the committee in writing at least 24 hours in advance. A member testifying may want to write their own testimony, but they don't have to. At AIA Ohio, Kate has written testimony as has Luther. Regardless of who writes it, the testimony should be provided to AIA Ohio in advance and Kate will see that it uh, is sent to the committee chair on time. She may even suggest a few helpful changes or revisions, imagine that. Um, <laughs> second, everyone who will testify must submit a witness slip in advance. Again, if you're testifying on behalf of AIA Ohio, Kate will do this on your behalf in advance of the hearing. The chair will use these to call you uh, for your testimony. If you choose not to testify verbally, or if you're unable to attend a hearing, you may submit written testimony only. The same rule applies 24 hours in advance. For SB 49, the surveyors and ACEC Ohio both submitted written testimony in support of the bill, but neither group testified in person. If you're verbally testifying, it is important that you not read the written testimony you've submitted in advance. The committee members can and will read the testimony. Use your time at the podium to summarize it, hitting the highlights and to be available for questions. Provide your testimony in a con conversational format and allow legislators to better understand your concerns. Finally, when verbally testifying, you always begin speaking by addressing the chair. For example, if you're gonna to testify to the Senate Transportation Committee, which is chaired by Stephanie Kunze, you would begin your testimony. Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Bruce Sikanik, and I'm here today to speak with you about this important piece of legislation. Finally, the third hearing is for opponent testimony. If there is an organization that opposes the bill, this is the opportunity to be heard. Most recently, AIA Ohio has offered opponent testimony on HB 504, the Interior Design Licensing Bill, presented in 2018. That bill did not pass. It was reintroduced in 2019 as HB 402, and AIA Ohio was pre prepared to provide opponent testimony again. The bill never received a third hearing. After three hearings, the committee chair can bring the bill forward for a vote of the committee. If the vote is yes, the bill lives another day and it advances to the full chamber. If they vote no, the process is over and the bill dies. Once in the chamber, legislators offer speeches for or against the proposed legislation and the vote is taken. If the chamber passes the bill, it continues its journey. If the chamber does not pass the bill, it dies. At this point, you're either at the end or at the halfway point and it goes to the next chamber. It's important to note that each Ohio General, General Assembly session lasts for two years. Right now, we are in the 134th General Assembly of the Ohio legislature. In order to provide uh, maximum amount of time to successfully navigate the process, a bill has the best chance if it's introduced as early as possible in the first year of a legislative session because the process takes time. As we finish discussing the, discussing the process in the Senate and head to the second chamber, Karen, you have some interesting facts on the Ohio House of Representatives. Karen? Thanks, Bruce. We talked earlier about the Ohio Senate. Now it's the House's turn. Let's learn a little more about the makeup of the Ohio House of Representatives. With 99 members of the Ohio House of Representatives, there are three times as many representatives than senators. An interesting fact is that the districts are drawn so that three House districts geographically reside within each Ohio Senate district. The House currently consists of 35 members who are Democrats 
and 65 members who are Republicans. Similar to the Senate, the first female representative in the House served in 1923, and currently 32 of the 99 members of the House are women. In 1879, the first African-American legislator served in the House as well. Like the Senate, the members of the House are part-time and each make an annual salary of $65,528. While the members of the House are allowed ultimately to serve the same number of years as senators, the year served per term is two and the number of terms is four. All 99 seats of the Ohio House of Representatives are up for election every two years. As you can see from the diagram, the Republican Party currently has a significant lead in the House and through this majority control the leadership roles. Kate? Okay, so when a bill makes it through committee and passes the first chamber, it must then repeat the process on the other side. And yes, this is as difficult as it sounds. For any number of reasons, the bill may not make it to hearings in the committee or it might not make it through the hearing process. Even if advanced for a committee vote, the bill could fail to move on to the full chamber floor. Only when the bill has been placed on the agenda by the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate is there reason for optimism. After three hearings, the committee in the second chamber votes. If they vote in favor of the bill, it advances to the full body. If they vote against the bill, the bill dies. The last step in the process is for a bill that passes the committee to be advanced to the full second chamber for a vote. On the House side, whether or not a bill is heard by the full House is dependent on the Speaker of the House who sets the agenda. And on the Senate side, whether or not a bill is heard by the full Senate is dependent on the Senate President. In both chambers, speeches may be made from the floor before the vote is taken. Bills that make it this far are very likely to pass. The Speaker and the Senate President aren't likely to give floor time to a bill they don't believe has a future. Uh, Luther, when a bill is introduced, we often focus uh, a lot on the sponsor. Are there good and bad legislators? Thank you, Kate. To answer that, I want to uh, go back to the point about consensus building and ask this question or pose this question for you in your mind. By what right do you have to talk to a legislator at all? And the answer is, that you have an absolute First Amendment constitutional right, both in the federal and state constitutions, not only the right to free speech, it expressly says you have the right to lobby your legislators. And that includes giving pack checks under interpretations by the United States Supreme Court. Con contributions are a form of speech. Sending a letter is a speech. Uh, and so, the question becomes, in your networking, in your consensus building, are there legislators that you should uh, think about as good or bad? And the answer is no. Uh, you should never assume that they have any clue about what you do. Uh, most impressions about everything. I mean, again, what we just previously said, it was a part-time legislature. You need 51% of the barber, the farmer, the coal miner, maybe a lawyer, not likely, the electrical contractor, the uh, professional engineer, Bill Blessing from Cincinnati. Uh, and how do you get them? You cannot assume that they understand what you want. There has been a trend because of social media and because of uh, uh, certain, uh, the lack of uh, uh, working the, the crowd at night, uh, things have changed over the years that I've been lobbying. And so some legislators come with an idea how they're going to change the law without regard to proponents. And we've seen lots of legislation introduced that they just pulled off and downloaded from the internet. And they have a philosophy that for instance, they bring with them the idea that government is bad or government is too big. And those are not bad legislators, but again, you have to understand they don't know what you want until you build the relationship. And that's the distinction I think that you have to understand 
when you go into these committees. When I argue a case in front of the Ohio Supreme Court, what do I see? I see seven politicians who ran for office statewide that are no different than running for governor. They are Democrats and Republicans. They were nominated in a primary. They read newspapers and they've had a life before they sat up there in the black robe. I argue a Supreme Court case just like I would state a testimony at a Senate committee. They're both the same. And so you're educating them. That's what you're doing. You're not arguing a case. You're not uh, testifying in a committee. You're explaining to them your viewpoint. Let me give you an example of two legislators in my practical history uh, that my clients uh, looked at as enemies. And they were wrong. They're not enemies. They were friends of mine. And they are just as valuable to you, regardless of what you think they might think on one perspective. The issue in the construction industry for a long time, uh, in 1930s, the Republican legislature passed Ohio's prevailing wage law. Republicans passed that during the Depression because they did not want to pay for a taxpayer building bricks and mortar only to have out-of-state contractors come in, do the building and leave. They wanted to buy America, buy local, buy Ohio. That's the basis of the prevailing wage law. Over the years, the largest contractors uh, to build a skyscraper, how do you pay for, train, and maintain on staff a uh, hundred electricians if you don't if you work by winning competitive bids and you haven't won a bid, you're paying the salaries when they're not at work. And that was the evolution of the union hall also in the 1930s and 40s. So that the employers got together and whoever wins the competitive bid gets to use the electricians from the training hall. That's the idea of prevailing wage to make sure that out of state contractors don't undercut the union hall that is being paid for by the contracting industry in Ohio. It's closely tied to the mechanics lien law. Separate primes and the mechanics lien law were passed at the same time in 1876. So those laws have history. Fast forward, labor unions have changed and the image of labor unions have changed in Ohio, as you know. Uh, in 1958, they were so strong, the Republicans tried to pass what's known as right to work legislation which would prohibit the unions from charging dues, mandatory dues. The result was an election across 50 states. It started in Ohio that threw the Republicans out of office. It was that strong at that time. It's not anymore. So the prevailing wage issue has become a hot coal, a hot football, unbelievably by Republicans trying to repeal it and labor union Democrats trying to preserve it. Two legislators in uh, early, a few decades ago, were on that Republican side. And they were uh, just visceral about their opposition to labor unions. Not so much prevailing wage, but they hated labor unions. And they, anytime they would talk, they would tell you that. It had nothing to do. What do you think of this barber bill? I hate labor unions. I think, okay, I got that. <laughs> and so the clients that I represented who are contractors, many of them Republican, nevertheless paid the prevailing wage, looked at those legislators as enemies. But that's not right. They had an understanding in their own view and we had a different view. And one of those views as well is that we want to preserve free and open competitive bidding. Those contractors who are all, while they pay prevailing wage, they also win by competitive bids and they don't like the fact that some people, like we've talked about in Medina County, have they try to use public works and steer the contract to someone that they favor. And that's illegal under Ohio law, but there's always people trying. So one time, a, then a bill came up that said, let's allow non-competitive bids by certain governmental entities, which is completely non-transparent completely anathema 
to the to the system of awarding contracts to the construction industry. And how do I fight that legislation? And I will tell you, it was a rather strong lobby group that was promoting it, wanting to repeal competitive bidding. And uh, the answer was the two guys, one is a Senator and one was a House of Representatives member who were absolutely opposed to prevailing wage, were principled on that issue. And likewise, their principle was in favor of competitive bidding. Uh, so as soon as I heard that they're trying to repeal competitive bidding, I went to those two legislators. One of them got up out of his chair in the middle of a committee hearing and walked over to the other committee and killed the bill in the Senate. The other was the chair where the thing was being held. And he said to me, Luther, don't worry, no hearings. Did not even get a proponent hearing against this major lobbying association that I don't want to mention. At the end of the, um, the one of the committee meetings, I'm walking out with a lobbyist who just got the news that his bill's not even going to have a hearing. And he shakes his head and he says, I don't have any idea how that happened or who got to the chairman. That's ridiculous. I should have gotten a proponent testimony at least. And I just laughed. I didn't tell me, tell him it was me because I didn't look at our enemies as enemies. They are also your friends. It's about networking. Never discount how valuable a legislator can be. And that might end up being valuable for you in your own practices locally with a county commissioner uh, or a, a city mayor, uh, even though you might think of him, he voted against my bill in the Senate. Who cares? Consensus bill, work the network. Thank you. Thanks, Luther. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, now we're going to talk a little bit about roadblocks, and apparently we need to add Luther to the list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there are many potential roadblocks. Um, if a bill does not get a hearing in either chamber, it fails. If the bill does not advance through the process before the end of the legislative session, it fails. Uh, if the bill is held by the Speaker or the President of the Senate and not given the opportunity to be heard by the full chamber, it fails. And if the bill does not pass both chambers with the same language, which Bruce is going to talk about in a minute, uh, the bill might still fail. So uh, let's hear a, for a second from Karen on exactly what percentage of bills introduced are actually completed during the life of an assembly. Thanks, Kate. As with any organization, agency, or public body, you get more things done in some years and less in others. The 134th General Assembly session lasts from January 1st of 2021 through December 31st of 2022. So far, they've introduced 319 bills to date, none of which have been completed. We can look back over time and see how that compares to other assemblies. While the 134th Assembly is just in the beginning stages, we can look back over the last seven assemblies and see exactly how productive the legislative branch has been. Even though we believe SB 49 is an important piece of legislation, there are no guarantees that it will make it all the way through the process by the end of the session. A lot of bills get introduced each year in these sessions. You can tell from the chart that a very small percentage become laws. So just under 8% to a little over 25% of bills introduced over the last seven years actually have passed into law. The seven session average pass rate is actually 14.6%. Bruce, well, Kate's covered some of the roadblocks. What are some of the other assembling blocks that might be um, in the way of passage? Well, thanks, Karen. Uh, even if a bill passes both chambers, it still might be in jeopardy. The second chamber can propose changes before passing the bill. Uh, these amendments to the original bill passed by the first chamber need to be reconciled before the bill can be uh, advanced. The amendments to the bill in one chamber may be provided to either improve the bill or kill the bill. Uh, the amendments can be big or small, but if the amendments are passed, the bill has to go back to the first chamber for concurrence. If the first chamber doesn't concur with the changes made by the second chamber, sounds complicated, a conference committee, including three members from each chamber, proposes compromise language. This compromise language uh, goes back to both chambers for approval. 
If both chambers accept the proposed language from the conference committee, the bill passes. If the conference committee cannot come to an agreement, the bill fails. If only one chamber accepts the compromise language, the bill fails. As you can see, there are more opportunities for a bill to fail than to pass. With these potential roadblocks in the way, it's important that any bill proposed address the broad concerns of legislators. That's why lobbying is such an important part of the process. And I'm going to jump back to you, Luther, one more time to talk a little bit about lobbying and why it makes a difference. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, starting with the networking, you can see how important it is in your own business, but it's about the relationships. And I will, I'll, I want to start with the concept that uh, it lobbying is slow and hard work, just as practice development is for your business. Um, in my own business uh, as an attorney, I have generally experienced that if I meet a new potential client, it'll be at least six months before they actually do anything with you because it's got a gestate. In, and I think people mentally <clears throat> hire you before the project comes along. They just don't tell you because they wait. And so there's a decision-making point at some point. Uh, and likewise, in the legislature, lobbying is, is very hard work, uh, particularly uh, you have to be patient and consistent. It's gotta be drip, drip, drip. So as an example, uh, let's start with how uh, it doesn't work. I remember uh, uh, talking to a new legislator from Cleveland, uh, a Democrat, and she was really enthusiastic. She's no longer in the legislature, so I'm not gonna give you a name, but um, <laughs> she was really enthusiastic about being here and we were enthusiastic working with her and trying to explain our, our background and what our clients were. And you know, you can tell when they're kind of half listening. She finally says, well, I thank you. I think this is, I want to tell you, it's a great job being a legislator. They pay you, they pay you a salary of $65,000 today and you don't have to do any work. Now, that's, <laughs> that was a waste of time. <laughs> That's not the legislator that gets things done. And so uh, you've got 132 of them to try again with, and you do have to go try again. To me, the better example was Speaker Vern Reif. Speaker Vern Reif uh, was from Scioto County, and he was the longest serving speaker in Ohio history. And the reason he was the longest serving speaker because he worked really hard. I was one of his candidates in 1982. I knew him personally. He became speaker for the first time and built the De Democratic caucus in the House by raising money for each and every individual legislator in his caucus. Uh, he went out and did fundraising for everybody else. And back then we didn't have caucus fundraisers or caucus. It was all the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, and that's it. And he went all over the state and helped everybody. Uh, and then during legislative sessions, there was a little bar downtown called the Galleria. And after Vern Wright has done the whole day of legislation, sat through committees, worked all the bills, he comes over to the Galleria and takes a corner booth. And he sits there and waits for anyone who would like to talk to the Speaker of the House. And not just chit chat. So you would go and slide in the booth and say to the speaker, here's what I've got, here's who I am, here's what I want. And he would say yes or no, make a note, stick it in his pocket, and you're done. And he would do it. And then the next person would come. He did that every night of every week of every session while he was Speaker of the House. That's a lot of work. The same thing used to be with all of the chairs of various committees. With Before term limits, you would have a chair that would come back and the same if you're the chair of liquor committee, you would be the chair of liquor committee in the next session too. So they had institutional knowledge and you could work with them and build a reputation and, and uh, uh, a uh, relationship for your client. That's not true anymore. As I think Karen said, you have no idea where your bill's gonna land. Uh, none of these people come back. I mean, they go, it's eight years you can be a legislator in the one or the other, then you have to leave. The reality is it's six years. The first year, they're a freshman. They have no idea what they're doing. The second year, they think they know what they're doing. 
the third year they maybe get something done and, and the fourth uh, fourth term I should say term fourth term they're off, off looking for another job uh, because it pays so much and you don't have to do anything uh, so <laughs> it's it's frustrating to uh, at first but the reality is you, you have to talk to everybody you have to know everybody you have to work everybody uh, and it is work but it's exciting work because when you get the right legislator, like a Speaker Vern Wright, they will pay back the dividend. They will say, like I gave you my rule, the answer is always yes, unless I'm already committed or it's against my, uh, uh, my principles. So I would say that's true if you ask every single legislator, they would say the same. They're here to do good. They're here to make a difference. They're generally not the lazy one. And, and so uh, it, it, uh, I think, in my mind, a lobbyist can be a coach and I bring you know, 40 years of experience with me that you may not have. But the truth is you have a, a better opportunity connecting with that local legislator than I do because you're gonna connect locally and you're gonna say what you do. And then I can go back and say, hey, you talk to this person and you build this network for the AIA statewide and the ACEC builds it for the engineers. And when we join hands and go together with legislators that you've been working, that's hard work, that, but that's networking, that's consensus building, and that's successful. Thanks so much, Luther. That, that's, uh, that's an interesting story. I, I can't imagine someone doing so much work, especially at the end of the day. And we've experienced some long days lately. So thank you, that's, that's some good insight. Um, we're going to finish up uh, about what happens once the um, both chambers have passed the bill. Um, it will be signed by the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. So this, uh, the signed bill goes to the governor, who can do one of three things. First, sign it, and now it's law. Veto it, or do nothing. If the governor uh, neither signs nor vetoes the bill, the bill automatically becomes law 10 days after it's submitted to the governor. If the uh, governor vetoes the bill, the legislature, both chambers, can override the veto with, as Karen said earlier, three-fifths vote. If all goes right, you now have a bill that becomes law. This is the end of a long process that often can take uh, multiple attempts. While each bill faces different challenges, they almost go through a process that reflects what we outlined today. Kate, why don't you take the next step and close this up for us? Okay. <laughs> So the making of legislation in Ohio is a drawn out process, as we've said, uh, helps ensure that the bills introduced are given the attention they deserve. And while left to a wide number of variables, the process is difficult yet necessary. What we've outlined today is graphically summarized in this roadmap. The summary of how an idea becomes a law shows the convoluted process through which AI Ohio must work to get legislation passed. To further our efforts to provide members with tools that will help you become stronger advocates for the profession, I'll be sending a copy of the roadmap to you by email after today's program. Um, this, it's something that we hope you'll share with others in your office so that everyone can become better familiarized with the process. I hope it's been informative um, and helpful and maybe a little interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be a dry discussion, but I'm going to turn this back over to Karen for questions before our special presentation. Thanks, Kate. So we've completed the first part of today's presentation. In a minute or two, we're going to move on uh, to the second part with Bob uh, Leverzage. So I want to take a minute to ask if anyone has a question uh, about the presentation so far, if you want to put something in the chat or um, ask to be recognized. Well, Kate does the magic of switching over to Bob's presentation here. Mm -hmm. So far, I've not seen anything in the chat. We must have answered everybody's questions <laughs> <laughs> and then some. <laughs> okay, it, oh, I hear one. Well, I'm just as, uh, wondering if Beth Easterday is still on and if she'd like to make any comments because I know they're actively working in the design profession as well. She messaged me, Luther, she had a one o'clock. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we're starting to get the chat. All right. So I see from uh, 
question from Don Frederick. How does AIA decide what bill to support or oppose? Luther, that might be a good one for you. Well, I'm going to boot it back to you guys. Uh, to <laughs> me, it's the client decides. Uh, you know, I'm a hired hand and I'm going to do what my client wants, not the way my client wants. I'm means and methods. And so I think you it's a really important thing to participate with your board, your local chapter, and have the consensus building dynamic first with your with your own. I can give you some realism. Uh, if your answer, if your question is, can I get uh, you know the law changed to give us a billion dollars for architectural design fees? I'm going to say no. And but uh, I really do think the client is the one that your board is the one that. And maybe you could elaborate on how you guys decide what you want to support. It's limited resources. And, and I, go ahead, Kate. I was just going to say, I'll jump in uh, to answer that question. Um, when legislation comes to our attention, uh, if, if it comes to my attention, I always start with the AI Ohio Executive Committee. Hey, Luther saw this come through. This looks like something that we might be interested in. Uh, let's have a conversation. The Executive Committee um, would have the conversation and then ultimately it would end up with the board. Um, where the direction that AI Ohio would take. We've also, we've got our uh, PAC committee um, that uh, one of the things that we've uh, changed a little bit about the PAC process this year is if you make a contribution to the AI Ohio PAC through that uh, form, we ask you what issues are important to you? What, uh, what, do, what do you wanna see uh, uh, impacted? What, what what are you passionate about? And so the PAC committee and then subsequently the AI Ohio board will be looking at, at the input from that form and to see, you know, is there something here that we maybe need to be proactive about? Or is there something in the legislature, legislature that, that people are telling us through this donation form that they want us to be reactive against? I'll just, I'll just share one thing. Um, I think that's important everybody understands is that when we choose to take a position on a bill we have to, and I, it was in our presentation but i'll just highlight that we have to follow the policies and positions of aia national and ai ohio's position statements so we always check against those position statements when we are considering uh, bills that affect our uh, architects in the state i'm going to do one more quick question because i don't want to cut into too much of bob's time here but michael michael max says I get the continual networking comments. However, how does one know the difference between networking and good old boy networking? <laughs> you need a good old boy. <laughs> <laughs> you need a, someone who's around horses that knows horses. Uh, and you know, the truth is a lot of what I would interpret that to mean is how do I know I'm getting Homer or someone behind the scenes? That, and unlike court, there are no rules. Uh, so it's it's there's a lot of good old boy networking going on always, and, but that's the nature of America and a history, and you shouldn't be worried or concerned about that. Uh, my message to you is, it works just like they taught you in high school. You can compete with that just as easily. Term limits has made that easier. There is a third turnover every session, so it, the, what used to be the good old boy and a lot of alcohol is uh, no longer exists in that form. Uh, it's still a lot of hard work and paying attention and building a statewide network. Thank you, Luther. So it looks like Kate has put the link that you can start to file for your CES in the um, chat. And I wanted to really thank Kate and Bruce and Matt Toddy and, and Luther for their contribution to today's advocacy workshop. You know, so as a, it's been a lot to put this together and I hope it was very informative for you. As the final part of today's program, we're going to have a virtual tour of the state of Ohio by uh, Bob Leverzage. His firm, Schooley Caldwell, is a recognized leader in preservation and state rest restoration. Bob, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to a virtual tour of the home of Ohio's legislative process. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, can everybody hear me okay and see my screen? Um, yes. So we've been talking uh, this afternoon about how a bill becomes a law. I'm going to talk a little bit about where a bill becomes a law in Ohio. 
uh, the state capitol, which we call in Ohio, we call the state house, um, houses the general assembly, the governor's ceremonial offices, uh, parking, special events, education, visitor center. It's a very busy building right in the center of, of downtown Columbus. But if you're uh, doing advocacy for AI Ohio, you may be asked to go see executive agencies, which are housed in the Road State Office Tower. Uh, you may uh, need to go see the judiciary at the Thomas J. Moyer Ohio Judicial Center, where the Supreme Court lives. Uh, the Rife Center for Government and the Arts is where the governor's working offices are and uh, all members uh, of the House of Representatives have offices there. And then the Senate building, which is attached to the original state capitol, of course, is where the uh, Senate offices and, and hearing rooms are housed. So these are the facilities that you would be coming to visit if uh, Karen or Kate or Luther call on you to, uh, to help us with, uh, with issues in the, in the General Assembly. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the building and its history, a little bit about uh, the massive renovation project that was done some years ago and, and then take you on kind of a, where you would be going within the building uh, kind of tour. Uh, our state house is a national historic landmark that puts it on a list of about 2000 buildings in the entire country that have national significance, both architecturally and historically. Uh, we're considered to be one of the best Greek revival architecture uh, uh, structures in the country, uh, an American uh, style of architecture. And of course, many, many very important historical events uh, have taken place in this building since it was completed. Now, this is uh, Civics 101, I guess. Um, Columbus was not the first capital, AL, city of, of Ohio. The capital moved around a little bit during the first uh, decades or so of, of the statehood. But once Columbus was established uh, as our state capital in 1816, uh, we built the state capital. We built this building that you see on the right, uh, right on the corner of High Street and State Street, where today there's a, an entrance to the underground parking garage. And this Capitol building looked uh, a whole lot like some of the earlier ones in Chillicothe, Zanesville, uh, and also county courthouses that were built uh, all over the state and, and this region. If you wanna see this building almost exact, go to Somerset, Ohio in Perry County where one of those courthouses still exists that was built in 1829. Uh, the building next to it was the state office building. Uh, it was usually referred to as Rat Row. Don't know if that's because of furry creatures in the basement or politicians who occupied the space, but uh, this is where state government happened uh, at the beginning of uh, Columbus's uh, term as, as uh, the state capital. Well, the state started growing pretty quickly and that little tiny building on the corner wasn't kind of doing it. So in 1838, uh, legislature issued a, a call for competition, a, an architectural design competition uh, to design a, a new capital for the state of Ohio. Uh, that competition uh, drew, I think, 68 entries. And this is the winning entry by an architect from Cincinnati named Henry Walter. Uh, you'll notice that the design uh, and the building that was built don't seem to relate to each other too much. But uh, basically, they hired Henry Walter as the architect of the capital. They said, we want you to come to Columbus and build this building. And oh, by the way, we want to change it. That never happens to any of us in our practice, I, I know. Uh, it took 22 years to build the Capitol. And that's not because it took that long to build a building. It took that long because the politics, uh, economic downturns, uh, cholera epidemics, uh, all different kinds of things that could delay uh, the construction of a project like this. So during that time, there were four architects of the Capitol and each one put their own kind of spin and their own unique uh, design elements into the final building. Along the way, they got some help from some actually some more famous people. Uh, Thomas Cole, the famous uh, Hudson River School painter who left behind evidence that he wanted to be considered the designer of the state house. Uh, Alexander Jackson Davis, who actually helped kind of pull together the changes that the legislature had in mind. And Richard Upjohn and Thomas Eustick Walter were consulted at some point when the, the state house commissioners thought the architect was kind of getting out of hand and making the building 
too elaborate and uh, in the end too expensive. This is the earliest photograph we've been able to find. I think it's about 1855 and you can see that the office building is still in place. And you can see if you look in the upper right that the uh, cupola uh, isn't quite complete yet. And we know that that was completed between 1857 and 1861. Nevertheless, here's the building that resulted. It's a very uh, austere, simple, <clears throat> pardon me, straightforward Greek revival building. And uh, just to give an idea uh, of the importance of this building, all of state government fit in this building. I mean, that's kind of an astounding thing to say today, I know, but uh, every department of government had space in the building, uh, kind of a simple cruciform plan surrounded, uh, surrounding four open light courts that brought uh, daylight and, and air down into a very deep building. And uh, the upper floor, the second floor had the big spaces like the Senate and, and the House, the Supreme Court and the State Library. So all of these things were, were in this building uh, at the beginning. And I remind you that it was built with um, uh, conventional methods, con conventional means and methods, and, and absolutely no tower crane. This was a substantial building. And uh, in 1849, the architect of the Capitol's report kind of compared it to the National Capitol of Washington, which you see here on the left. This is, of course, before the, the National Capitol got big wings for the House and Senate and before the cast iron dome. But this is the building that was the National Capitol when our Capitol was built. And you can see that they were about the same scale. Ohio is, you know, this little uh, kind of place in the wilderness was building a building that meant something, that was going to be something. Uh, our uh, in, inside the rotunda was actually taller than the one in the National Capitol at, at the time that it was built. And an idea of how this building uh, impacted the city of Columbus, this is a, an 1872 uh, aerial uh, bird's eye view. And you can see that the Capitol basically overwhelms uh, all of the rest of the scale of the city at that time. The city has since, of course, grown up uh, around this building, but the vision of the people that built it, uh, I think was pretty significant uh, when you think about it. Now, everybody wants to know why we don't have a dome. and some of my best speaker Rife stories um, relate to his questioning me about uh, the dome and whether we should put a dome on the Capitol. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it too much now because of time, um, but it has to do with the Civil War and uh, the fact that we were finished before the Civil War. And if you wanna hear more about that, I'm actually gonna talk about it uh, for AIA Columbus on March the 30th at noon. And you can, you can register online at aiacolumbus.org where I'm gonna talk about the restoration actually of four uh, iconic state capitals, uh, three of which have uh, significant domes. At any rate, the building opened in 1857 and the city of Columbus threw a party uh, for the entire state. And uh, it lasted at least 24 hours. Uh, we have the menu, we have how many barrels of oysters they consumed. Uh, it was one great big party and if you were from Columbus, you had to pay to get in. If you were not, if you were from anywhere else in the state, the party was for free. Lots of, uh, of course, historic events have taken place here. President Lincoln, uh, President-elect Lincoln actually received a telegram in the governor's office uh, informing him that the Electoral College had officially declared him to be the president-elect. Um, he campaigned here. And his body lay in state uh, after his assassination. And this is an, these are actual photographs of, of the crowds that came to see uh, the slain president as he lay in state in the rotunda for, I think it was only six or eight hours and he was visited by 50,000 people. It's pretty uh, incredible event that took place in our building. After the Civil War, of course, the state grew and became more and more important and government grew with it and we needed to expand the state house. And Samuel Hannaford, a significant architect from Cincinnati was hired to build uh, what was called the judicial annex. And uh, the Supreme Court and other agencies from the Capitol moved 60 feet to the east uh, into this uh, new annex building. And then about uh, 25, 30 years later, again, the building was filled 
and a committee was formed to discuss how we could expand the state capital. And a number of interesting suggestions uh, were made. This one by Houston Packard, uh, very uh, significant architects from, from Columbus would add a story. Another one would add a tower to the middle of the building. Uh, another example, uh, uh, McLaughlin uh, was an architect, I wanna say from Akron, but I could be wrong. Anyway, he was gonna put his tower on top of the annex building and, and make a connection back to the Capitol, which is kind of cool. Uh, what we got instead, I think is probably much better. Uh, the end result was this stately building on the side of the river uh, called the State Department's Building, which became the expansion space then for the Capitol uh, for quite a few years and uh, remained uh, in that capacity until uh, maybe 15 years ago when it was converted into uh, a new home for the Supreme Court of Ohio. The next big change was 1963. The state uh, dug a gigantic hole around the building and created an underground parking garage, uh, which reflects the fact that uh, the increased reliance on automobiles and frankly has made the building continue to be viable uh, today. That parking garage has 12,000, or 12,000, uh, 1,200 uh, parking places on three levels. Uh, un, uh, contrary to what some people believe, it does not go under the Capitol building. It surrounds it on, on three sides. So when the building opened, I mentioned this earlier, uh, it housed all of state government. And it did that in 53 rooms, I counted them. And every one of them had access to natural light, either from windows or from the open light courts uh, or skylights. And this is important because in 1838, when, when the building was designed, we didn't even have gas lights. Now, by the time the building opened, uh, it did have, we did have gas lights and it had many, many miles of gas piping uh, for that purpose. When we started working on the building in 1988, that's those same 53 rooms had been subdivided into 317. Uh, almost every room in the place had been uh, subdivided with uh, partition walls, sometimes horizontally if the ceiling was high enough. And every decorating scheme you could imagine, uh, every uh, Star Wars looking light fixture, every utility invented since the Civil War, all these things were added and added and added and added. And uh, it was really horrible. And I, I, I have visited about half the state capitals in the country and none of them before the renovations were ever as bad as ours. It was really, really bad. We found 93 separate air conditioning systems in the building. Some of them were window units that were in transoms that exhausted their the hot air into another room that then had to be air conditioned by the conditioning in that space. Luther's smiling because he was in all these rooms and he knows how bad it was. So in 1988, we were commissioned to do a master plan to figure out what to do about all of this. And uh, that was a fascinating process of uh, incorporating a lot of the things that the, the, the team was talking about a little bit earlier we didn't have to pass a lot of legislation, but we certainly had a lot of clients in this, in this uh, project, like every legislator. The really significant thing that happened out of that was a bipartisan, bicameral, public-private partnership and agreement that, gee, it's time to do something about this. We're ashamed of this building and we've got to get it right. And we were able to um, create a situation where the uh, House Speaker and the House Minority Leader and the President of the Senate and the President Minority Leader and the Governor and private foundations and business community all got together and said, we got to do this and we've got to do it right and we can't let it become uh, a, a big political issue. This was the press conference in this horrible room, but this is the press conference where uh, the Governor and all of these people announced this project to uh, to the public. And I point out to you that four members of AI Ohio were in that press conference. Uh, Carol Shafsky, who many of you know, uh, was the state architect and she was really instrumental in getting uh, all of this going. And John Schooley and I and Kurt Moody uh, formed a team and competed for and won the project to, to do the uh, 
at the, the design work. So finally, we got to start the construction and that involved site work, it involved underground work, it involved all new utilities. Our work uh, included getting rid of a lot of those 317 rooms that involved looking for and finding some of the original architect's drawings uh, for the building. Uh, of course, in those days, there wouldn't have been a set of bid documents like we have today. Each architect would do whatever drawings were needed at the time. And sometimes they just took them home with them when they got fired because as uh, we, you know, we still like to say in our documents that we own the drawings, but uh, most of the time we don't, uh, they did. We also had uh, to invent things. We had to experiment like, how can we make gaslight looking fixtures that create energy efficient and sufficient light for uh, the 20th, 21st century. We had to figure out how to get an air conditioning, a single air conditioning system into the building instead of 93 separate ones. Uh, it involved sometimes cutting ductwork into four foot thick stone walls. Um, so here you can see the before and after of the same room and uh, what we did with the mechanical systems and hiding them uh, in the walls and so forth. Lots of research, uh, historic research, newspapers, uh, magazines, uh, archives where there were photographs, uh, everything we could do to try to understand what had happened to the building uh, over all of those years so that we could put it back in a way that would um, uh, allow us to, uh, to have contemporary government and, and do the things we need to do uh, but in an environment that seemed uh, appropriate to the historical significance, the architectural significance uh, of, of the state house. And the photographs you know, would, would give us all kinds of hints. This one particularly helped us with, uh, with furniture styles and, uh, and carpet. Uh, and so you can see we've reproduced that carpet in this uh, particular hearing room. This is the house chamber before kind of painted pale green or pale white, I'm sorry, pale blue with white trim, uh, overcrowded. This is the earliest photograph. And we did tell the members that once we restored the chambers, they would not have to wear top hats. But these kinds of photographs, as, as fuzzy as they are, gave us all kinds of information about uh, what these chambers were like. This is an engraving of President-elect Lincoln giving a speech to the uh, to a joint session of the General Assembly and, and the chambers uh, after we restored them. Uh, same thing with the Senate. Uh, we went through the same kinds of exercise there and, and were able to put back uh, skylights and light fixtures and colors and textures and fabrics, uh, all of which are uh, appropriate to uh, the period at the same time, uh, creating uh, and, and sometimes hiding very modern technology so that we can uh, operate this, uh, this building as a working capital uh, in the 21st century. Remember the four light wells I mentioned, of course, they had all been filled in with various sundry additions and accretions and stairways and things. And our, our vision there was to find a place uh, where we could put uh, exit stairs, and we could put elevators, neither of which were uh, particularly required at the time uh, that this building was built. And in the basement, every utility invented since the Civil War was still there, and uh, it was just a hodgepodge of space. And by stripping it down, putting the utilities underground, we were able to find space, essentially an entire level of the building that could be devoted to uh, public uh, uh, public space for visitors and, and children and guests and so forth. So in 19, and it, this is the Senate building, uh, the annex building in 1988 when we started and you can see a, a patronage type parking lot where the, the cars literally banged into the building. They were so close and, uh, the, and, and the legislature simply stopped spending money on this building. Uh, the Columbus dispatch across the street would constantly lobby for uh, tearing the building down. And so legislature just stopped spending money on it. Uh, but we found a lot of good bones in here. We're able to put back the things that were missing and uh, restore this really pretty magnificent building that very few people I think had ever bothered to visit or needed to visit. 
the Supreme Court had met in this building and um, we were able to take their chambers and, and put them back as, as hearing rooms for, in this case, for the Senate. Uh, sometimes it just got so bad that uh, they would just lock the door and occupy the room next door. This is the same room uh, after. And we created office spaces then for uh, for the Senate. And another problem of having such an old Capitol building, a pre-Civil War Capitol building, there's no space to do modern things for gatherings of large groups of people, for political events, for uh, concerts, for art shows, for all the different kinds of things that people want to do in their state capital. And so uh, we were asked to design an addition that would fit between the two buildings and close that space and create a space that, that would work well for those kinds of activities. Uh, this space was called Pigeon Run because the pages that worked in the annex building would have to run across this terrace to get to the state capitol and dodging the, uh, the very significant pigeon population that we had at that time. Uh, if you visit the atrium sometimes and look, I'll give you a hint, if you look up in here, you may find uh, Roger, the, uh, the stuffed pigeon that we left kind of uh, in honor of the pigeons that used to be here. So they had a party in 1857 to open the building. We had a week's law, a week long celebration in 1996 to uh, celebrate the rededication of the Capitol. And there were free events for children, for, for families, for construction workers, for state workers, and then a big gala uh, fundraising dinner that paid for all of the other, uh, uh, all of those other elements. And it was, a, it was a, a grand time for us having worked for 10 years uh, to keep this thing going. And when I say us, of course, it, as you, all of you know, as architects, it takes a lot of people to do a project like this. And we had a great team um, during that whole 10 year period of that project. And a number of, of my colleagues uh, are still uh, working with us uh, today. They worked on the state house, uh, the original state house project. And the state of course changes too. And that, uh, as you know, when your client changes, things, you know, uh, kind of get thrown up in the air sometimes. We had uh, five, I think, state architects during that period of time. We had two governors. Um, and so the, the good news was that political consensus that we had uh, lasted through that whole time. And since then, we haven't been doing nothing. We've been as architect of the Capitol, any grand building or cathedral, anything, there's always something going on. And uh, we've, we've completed a number of pretty significant projects uh, in the State House over the years, including recently the Ohio Holocaust and Liberators Memorial, which was designed uh, by Daniel Leapskin. And, uh, and we worked with his office to install that. We're currently engaged in a $30 million project to repair the structure of the underground parking garage. Not a very sexy project, but a very necessary one because it's been attacked by salt for uh, all of these years. Two things we had nothing to do with that I think just think are kind of fun, uh, a license plate and a Lego uh, uh, version. So that's our building and that's where, uh, you know, where the, I guess Luther says it's not the sausage is made, but that's where the, uh, the legislature does its thing. And we're hoping that some of you will become involved in advocacy at the state house. And if you do, uh, since you're all architects and you all have eidetic memories, I expect you to memorize these floor plans. Uh, but mostly what I want to do is kind of walk you through and just give you the logic of where you're likely to be going, uh, starting with parking in the underground parking garage. And uh, getting into the building, you know, it used to have, I think when we opened the building at 13 uh, public entrances, uh, that was before a lot of security events happened and we had to close things down. Today, there are three public entrances to the building, one directly from the underground parking garage, one from Third Street, and one uh, into the State House itself at the south end, uh, the State Street uh, end of the building. And the reason, of course, that they've cut down the number of entrances is that, that we have security now. Uh, when you visit, you have to uh, anticipate going through a metal detector, uh, sending your, uh, your briefcase and your phone and your purse, 
uh, through the x-ray machine, just like any other public building uh, uh, today. Now, getting around the building is a lot easier than it was before the renovation. Uh, we've actually put stairs and elevators in sort of logical places where you kind of expect them to be. Uh, each quadrant, uh, the two of the, the, of the light wells have been converted into elevators and stairs, the grand stair hall in the Senate building. So getting around is, is not too uh, terribly difficult. We have conventional stairs like this. We have uh, fire exit stairs that are required. Uh, I think I mentioned that the uh, uh, light courts have been converted into uh, stairs and elevators. And you might be invited to an event in the rotunda or in the atrium. Those are big spaces that are actually pretty easy to find. There's also a, a press conference room. So sometimes we get invited to uh, see uh, legislators make an announcement. That one is, uh, is on the first floor and directly across from that is the state room. Uh, which is a reception. So the rotunda is used for all kinds of events, uh, ceremonies, uh, celebrations, uh, commemorations. Uh, and it's just cool to show this picture because you know not too many people look down on that fantastic floor. The atrium is used for all kinds of things. Um, and it's probably where we'd be having this meeting today if, uh, if it weren't for COVID. Uh, but lots of events take place uh, there. This is the briefing room. It's a fairly recent addition to the Capitol. We converted a, a, a little used uh, Senate hearing room into a press room. And this is the state room. This is the room where that press conference was taken, uh, pre press conference was, was done that I showed you earlier. Now, if you're, the bill is a Senate bill or if it's in the Senate and you're gonna go to a hearing for the Senate, it's gonna be on the North side of the building. The Senate chambers, of course, the big room on the second floor, and the Senate has uh, four hearing rooms uh, that are used by its various committees, one in the State House and the others in the Senate building itself. Not too hard to find, but always on the, um, on the north side of, of the Capitol. This is the Senate uh, in action. They look very serious. I think they may be praying or maybe sleeping. I'm not sure which. Uh, this is one of the Senate hearing rooms in action. This is a big one, a very large committee. It could seem a little bit int uh, intimidating, but it really isn't because uh, generally speaking, they, they appreciate the fact that you've come to talk to them. Another hearing in uh, the North hearing room for the Senate. This is our own President Karen uh, giving testimony in uh, a COVID distance uh, hearing room. Uh, which which we're we're into right now. If it's a house bill, the same thing applies. The house uh, hearing rooms are on the south side of the building. Uh, the house chamber, of course, on the second floor, and a whole series of hearing rooms on the the ground floor, the first floor, uh, and even the a large hearing room up on the third floor. The house is in session here and. I kind of hope that's not your legislator in the corner there on the left. Uh, one interesting difference between the House and the Senate is that the House uh, votes electronically and the Senate votes by uh, voice, uh, vo voice vote and can do it in about 30 seconds. This is a House hearing room, same uh, basic setup. The House committees tend to have more members uh, because it's a bigger body. so. Uh, but the, the scale and the approach and, and the, the protocol is all the same. Uh, if you get invited to go to the governor's ceremonial office, sometimes we get invited there for a bill signing or something like that. It's in the northwest quadrant of the building. This is how uh, it looks when you approach it from the, the hallway. And this is the room uh, inside the very desk where Governor Dennison sat across from President-elect Lincoln and talked about uh, the future of uh, the war that everybody knew was coming uh, at that point. And then oftentimes uh, in advocacy, we meet with members in their offices. And uh, again, the Senate building is, is convenient. It's right there. All of the Senate members have offices in the Senate building, except for the president of the Senate, who's in the State House on the second floor, and the minority leader of the Senate, who's in the State House on the third floor. 
Otherwise, all of their offices are in the Senate building. And if you're looking for a House member, their offices are all across the street in the Vern Rife Center for Government and the Arts with the exception of the speaker and minority leader, which have, uh, who, who have uh, ceremonial offices in the state house. Uh, but generally speaking, all of the meetings of that type for the house are going to be over in the, in the Rife Center. So that's my tour. Um, I, I wish we could do it in person. Maybe next year we'll do it in person, but uh, it's a fabulous building. It's one that I've spent a great deal of my professional career uh, working on, and uh, we're pretty proud of, of the work that was done there by members of AI Ohio. Thank you, Bob. That's a really fabulous walkthrough. Very much appreciated your presentation today. Um, we're running a little long, so I think we're going to skip the Q&A because I think it was pretty darn comprehensive tour. Um, I want to remind you just of just a few things. I want to thank our sponsors again, remind you that our next advocacy series program is entitled Finding Your Voice. It'll be held on April 21st. Also of note, um, AI Ohio design lecture series is going to begin next week on March 21st. We're going to feature Barbara Besser, FAIA. You can go to aiohio.org for more information and to sign up. And um, if you haven't already, you got a few seconds left to click on the link that Kate put in the chat to get your learning units for today's program. And thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the next AI Ohio virtual online event. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.